happy sabbath church happy, happy sabbath happy. happy sabbath that extreme end praise god amen. amen that is powerful that is beautiful are you blessed to be here yes. did you like that music was it amazing yes. wow that is what we have been experiencing throughout the week so if you missed it just know that is how it has been so we want to thank so much the compassionate acquire for such wonderful singing that is so beautiful 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 i know that when we get to heaven music will be much more than that and thank you to the glorious women ministries choir for such a brilliant item of music i want to take this opportunity to invite and to welcome all of us today here to the worship of the lord and to the sharing of this hour throughout the week we have been blessed by the ministry of sister monica and uh, today she's ministering in advent advent hope and so god has given us a chance that we may share together you know every year in the second week of june it is always the women ministries week of emphasis and i want to challenge every girl every young woman and every older you know the elder women who is here who have never had an opportunity to attend one day of a week of emphasis my sisters you do not know what you miss so i urge you because this week will be repeated next year god willing make an appointment of visiting i mean it is a heart to heart moment with god and i know that those who came here in the course of the week they can attest to that so today we are culminating the women uh, women ministries week of emphasis and and we are looking at the heroines of faithfulness every time we go through the scripture and especially when we are opening the oracles of god with the little children we always talk about heroes of faith today men the scripture has turned over and we are talking about heroines of faithfulness so who is a heroine a heroine is a woman who is admired for her courage outstanding achievements or noble qualities so it's not just a coward but is a courageous person who is able to shed off the shell of you know the shell of popularity the shell of public to stand on that what they know is correct and right and today that is what we are going to look or to meditate upon every time that you talk about women what comes to the mind they are the usual you know the great you know the great women of faith in the scriptures mention them hannah mary esther ruth of course that is why we are named after them i'm called mary so i carry the name of a great woman of faith but do you know that also in the scriptures there are also women who have not been given too much attention but they are also heroines of faith you know they have stood out they have stood for that what is right and today we're not going to focus on the you know the well known women but the well the less mentioned and the less given attention so in the course of the week we talked about you know Deborah and Jael and their victory with the children of Israel we talked about Dorcas uh, a woman a great pioneer of the uniform we are wearing you know we talked about the widow of Zarephath we talked about Rahab the harlot and you know the role she played in the delivery of the children of Israel you know she secured the spies who went to Jericho and we talked about the young little maid of uh, the great soldier Nehemiah but today the focus is on 
two women who are less known or who are given less attention. Before we start, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for giving us an opportunity to gather together. Lord, it has taken your hand. And so this moment, we want to tarry in your presence and to reason together in scripture. We invite your presence. We pray that, O oh Lord, you will forgive our sins. You will cleanse us from every unrighteousness that can bar us to have a communion with you. And in a special way, we invite the presence and the power of your Holy Spirit to break this bread of life to us, to each of us, according to our spiritual needs, to the glory of your name. Thank you, Lord, for being with us in Jesus' name. So I know today there was ha uh, we were having uh, some challenges by the road, and so majority of the congregation could be following us online. And so I, I welcome as well the online audience. You will forgive me, but you know, uh, when you are in children's ministry, you are always a child. So if you see me behaving like a child, just know that is our nature. That is how we usually do it. And so I want us to take our Bibles and see how many traveled with their weapon to church. My Bible. Come on, church. We cannot shy to lift up our weapons, right? Can we? No. My Bible. My Bible. Oh. That God gave without measure. We are traveling together. My Bible and I. I hope you're traveling with your Bible. In the book of Acts, our key text is coming from the book of Acts, chapter 5 and verse 29. And before we read this church, if you read the book of Acts, you will realize uh, that this is, this is actually the moment when Jesus was leaving his disciples and so he had his last meeting with them. And the Bible tells us in the book of Acts that Jesus told his disciples that they should not start any work before the Holy Spirit comes upon them. And so there was a great commission, there was a very great responsibility that was laid on their shoulders. But they were to tally until the helper is sent to them. And so we find the disciples tarrying, we find them uh, receiving the Holy Spirit, we find the ministry of the apostles starting in the book of Acts. And I want to tell you, church, the preaching of the apostles was such powerful. It was such a powerful ministry because of the Holy Spirit. Why? In one sitting, they would do a meeting and there would be conversion of 3,000 people. Is that, a, is that a small meeting? No. That is a great, great power. And one of the apostles mentioned is John and Peter. You know, their work was attended with such great power and miracle such that People would carry their sick relatives and lay them by the roadside so that as Peter is passing by, his shadow, just a shadow, would touch them. And they believed that because of their power, people would be healed. As much as we Christians would look at that and think, wow, what a great ministry. There are some people who thought that, uh-uh, these ones, they will bring out people from the religion that we know. And so, the leaders of the church, they were so angry about this ministry and the manifestation of this power that they tried all they can to make the disciples stop 
spreading the gospel of Jesus. But because of, because of what the disciples, the apostles had experienced with Jesus and what they had witnessed when the power of the Holy Spirit came upon them, they could not shut down. Actually, we see in several locations, right from Acts chapter 3, between 3 and 4, we see uh, Peter and John being jailed. We actually see them following them and keeping on. And don't mention the name of that man. Don't mention the name of that man. But you know, in verse 29, when uh, Peter was called uh, before the leaders of the church and was asked, why do you have to keep on going against us? Why do you keep on going against the leadership of the church? I mean... Why are you keeping on going against the patriots and the rules and the laws that we've been taught? We find Peter replying in this manner. Peter and the other apostles replied, we must obey God rather than human beings. Other versions will tell you, we rather obey God than man. And that is the leading of this team. So there are instances that we will find in our lives where the human authority is rising up against the, the divine authority, that is God. And that is where Peter is telling them that when that then happens, I would rather go, obey God than man. But I know in this congregation, somebody will tell me, anyway, Peter was an apostle, anyway, Peter was a disciple, anyway, I'm not a preacher, so at no point will I be needed. To, to strike such a balance. But I want you to walk with me to the book of Exodus chapter 1 as we examine a story that relates very closely with you and with me. The book is Exodus. For those of us who are struggling to find where Exodus is, is the second book in the Bible just after Genesis. So we want to ask ourselves, even as we hold on to that, what happens when your profession gives you the unique opportunity to do an extraordinary assignment, whether for good or for bad? Then what happens when obedience to God conflicts with obedience to man? What happens then when you are faced with life-threatening consequences. What happens when standing for right is the only test of faith? So, Exodus chapter 1, the Bible starts by saying, and we are all going to read, so please don't get tired. These are the names of the sons of Israel who went to Egypt with Jacob, each with his family. Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, and Benjamin, Dan, and Naphtali, Gad, and Asher. Verse 5 says, the descendants of Jacob numbered 70 in all. Joseph was already in Egypt. In short, what these verses tell us is, Jacob had 12 children. Of course, he had 12 sons. Yes, he had 13, but he had 12 sons. He had 12 sons. And because, Jacob, uh, and, and because Joseph was already in Egypt, so he needed not to go with them. So the ones who went to Egypt were 11 of them. We all know what happened for Joseph to find himself in Egypt prior to his brothers. So verse 6 says, now Joseph and all his brothers and all that generation died. But the Israelites were exceedingly fruitful. They multiplied greatly, increased in numbers, and became so numerous that the Lord was filled with them. Verse 8, I, 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 am, I am going with the New International Version. I, I, and I know you're reading your version, and you may find a word here and there that is, that is not going in line with me, which is all right. 
But you will realize in verse 5, we heard that there were only 70 of them who went, of the descendants of Jacob, who went to Egypt. Again, after they have stayed uh, in Egypt for a while, so there was a lot of newborns and there was a lot of things that happened in between that, we find that the children of Israel really, really increased. I want us to take a step back for us to be able to understand what is happening ahead and go back and start reflecting right from Genesis chapter 45. In Genesis chapter 45, you will find uh, Joseph, uh, after you will find uh, Joseph making known uh, himself to the brothers. So what had happened before there was, so Jacob, uh, Jacob has gone through the prison, he has been promoted to the prime minister, and then the, um, this is because this is a result of uh, saving the nation from the great famine that was coming. And then now the famine itself has come. And, you know, the nations, the neighboring nations together with all the people that were in Egypt, they all start, started going to Pharaoh for food because there was famine. And when Je uh, Jacob's sons were going for food, so they went and they were served by Joseph. And so after some incidents, so Joseph reveals himself to his brothers. You would read the story by yourself. And one thing that happens, I want you to have this in mind, Joseph did not do a secret thing. He did not reveal himself to his brothers secretly. So it was a public thing. Actually, in verse 20, that is Genesis 45 and verse 20, No, Genesis 46 and verse 26, to cut all that, we will find Pharaoh extending his, extending his invitation or his welcome to Jacob's, uh, to Jacob's family, that is to Joseph's uh, brothers and father. And actually he says, uh, Joseph, you're responsible of taking care of your family. So they will be given the portion of food as they want. So their coming to Egypt was nothing secret. It, it, it was not a sneak in, no. It, it's not nothing that would have demanded a deportation. No, they came rightfully. And actually the king gave them the authority to settle down. That is Genesis 45 verse 16 says, when the news reached fellows Paris that Joseph's brother had come, Pharaoh's and all his officials were pleased. Pharaoh said to Joseph, Tell your brothers, do this. Load your animals and, and return to the land of Canaan and bring your father and your families back to me. I will give you the best of the land of Egypt and you can enjoy the fat of the land. So Pharaoh has welcomed uh, Jacob's family and they have actually settled on the outcasts, you know, of the city, a place called Goshen. And these people who are 70 in number, all of a sudden, they multiply and they become a great, great nation. They must have found a great favor in the sight of God. It never ended there. As the famine was going on, what Joseph did to the Egyptians, he told them, for you to be given a portion of food, you needed to buy it. So what they would do, they would come with their money and trade in. You give money, you get the grains. You give money and you get the grains. And because the famine was for a long time, the money was worn out, so there was no money. And the next, the next step was, you bring your animals. So you would give the animals in exchange of food. And the famine did not end. And the animals were over. So if you had your cattle, you have given out and you have nothing. And so these people still need to feed. So what is the next thing that they need to give? They need to give out their lands. So they started selling their lands to the state. So if, if it was here in Kenya then, uh, we would ensure that we give all our land back to the government. So if you want food, you give a portion of your land 
and then you get grains. And within no time, all the people were left, all the people in Egypt were left without money, without animals, and without land. They have sold themselves to the slavery. I mean, they have sold themselves to the states. And in Genesis chapter 7, even as we conclude in this part, we find that now after all this was done, the king, uh, Joseph, uh, in the command of the king, gave them a leeway on how to survive. He told them, the government is going to lease you your own land. So you are a Kenyan, but the Kenyan government is going to lease you the land for you. So you're going to toil, and after the harvest, you're going to be giving one-fifth, one-fifth uh, of your portion to the government. And then you, you take care of four. And that, because they had already sold the land, did not return to them. Let's get back to, Gen to Exodus uh, chapter 1 and verse 8. So this rule of giving a fifth to the state, back to the state, continued, continued, continued. It was not a one, a, a one king policy. It is an all-time policy, and that is how they were doing it. But in verse 8 of Exodus chapter 1, very interesting, the Bible tells us, Then a new king, to whom Joseph meant nothing, came to power in Egypt. He said, look, he said to his people, The Israelites have become far too numerous for us. Come, we must deal shieldry with them, or they will become even more numerous. And if war breaks out, we'll join our enemies, fight against us, and leave the country. So after the king who was known or who knew Joseph had passed and others have come and the generation that was there with Joseph has passed, a new king came in. And he did not, it is not that he had not known, it is not that Joseph had done nothing. Anyway, he has found a policy that says a fifth of your produce is supposed to be given to the state. Does it mean he doesn't understand where this policy came from? No, he actually knew very well. But the spirit of prophecy in Patriarchs and Prophet, page 242, tells us that he did not want to think about that. He, believed, he lived like he did not see that as a thing. Actually, it says, not that he was ignorant of Joseph's service to the nation, but he wished to make no recognition of them. And so far as possible, to bury them in oblivion. He wanted to live in a state of like it never happened. Because he wanted to brush it off, it never happened. And fear crept into his heart when he saw how the population of the children of Israel was increasing. Every time there is fear, there is always a response. When you're walking in darkness, and your seventh sense tells you there is something that you can't see. What do you do? The next thing you do is to guard yourself, right? You guard yourself. And for this king, when he saw how this number had increased, that sense in him rose, you know, the sense of fighting back. And he said, we must deal wisely. Actually, King James Version said, let us deal wisely with these people. But you know what, children of God? The wisdom of man is foolishness before God. The foolishness of man, the, the wisdom of man is foolishness before God. And this is confirmed in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 19. You can read it by your very, uh, your very own. And so he had to come up with a plan and a brilliant human plan for that case. Let's see what plan he will come with. Verse 11, it says, So they put slave masters over them to oppress them with forced labor. And they built Pidom and Lamesis as store cities for fellow. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and spread, so that the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites and worked them ruthlessly. They made their lives bitter with the harsh rubber in brick and mortar 
and with all kinds of work in the fields. In all their harsh labor, the Egyptians worked them ruthlessly. They really had to work them. So the first, the first thing, the first response, and the best plan the king would think about, we must increase their labor. If we increase their labor, it will be too much. They will have no time, uh, you know, for multiplication. They will have no time for bringing more children. They will have no times of increasing. I mean, they will be tired. It will be man to himself. But we said what? Their very best plan was actually working against them. God made it so. That the very best plan of uh, the king worked against them. Instead of the population coming down, it actually multiplied and increased exceedingly. And so they became more ruthless. And the generation also, the nation also of the, the children of Israel also increased by the power of God. And the king realized this strategy will not work. When strategy A fails, you devise strategy B. And so the kings decide Let's change the strategy. I think that was a bad season. Maybe this one will work. And so in verse 15, the Bible says, the king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, whose names were Shifra and Pua, when you are helping the Hebrew women during childbirth on the river stool, if you see that the baby is a boy, kill him. But if it is a girl, let her live. The midwives, however, feared God and did not do what the king of Egypt had told them to do. They let the boys live. Then the king of Egypt summoned the midwife and asked them, Why have you done this? Why have you left the boys to live? The wisdom of man is foolishness before God. So plan B Midwives, if these people keep on giving birth, you know, when they're coming to bring more babies, at the stool bath, kill the baby boy. If it is a girl, let her live. If it is a boy, kill them. I actually, off the story, I actually had somebody say that if you, do, if you want to depopulate a, an ethnic group or a community, you marry their daughters. Because when you marry their daughters, then they become the other population and not actually what is the original. And so that was the strategy of this king. We kill the baby boys, we let the girl live. If they are married, they will all be Egyptian, right? Yeah, that is a good strategy. But you know what? At the very hands of the command that he gave were people who feared God and they said no. And so the plan, the plan B of the king did not work. When the plan B does not work, what does he do? He devised a plan C. Let's see what the plan C is about. 19 says, the midwives answered Pharaoh, Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women. They are vigorous and give birth before the midwives arrive. So God was kind to the midwives and the people increased and became even more numerous. And the midwives feared God. He gave them families of their own. Verse 22 says, Then Pharaoh gave this order to all his people. Every Hebrew boy that is born, you must throw into the Nile. But let every girl live. So his plan C, he's still going after the boy child. So if the boy child then, if the boy child is, so the first strategy is the boy, the children not to be conceived. That fails. So the first plan, the second plan is the boy child to be killed at birth. That fails. So the third plan is kill the boy child when he's alive. Take them and throw them into the river Nile. And children of God, this plan worked and could not work. The spirit of prophecy still in Patriarchs and Prophets, chapter 22, says, Satan was the mover in this matter. He knew that a deliverer was to be raised up among the Israelites. And by leading the king to destroy their children, he hoped to defeat the divine purpose. 
As much as this was being seen as the hand of the king and the plan of the king, who was the mastermind? Satan. Satan was the mastermind behind this. And, you know, one thing I want to tell you, my brothers and sisters, the devil does not give up. The devil keep on increasing his strategy, you know. When he has set a strategy or he has raised a scheme, and by God's power you evade, he brings up another one. And by God's power you, and he brings up another one. And so your hope and my hope is to keep on holding to Jesus. Because that is the only way that you will be a victor. If these women never feared God, the children of Israel, the, the, the plan of saving them from the Egypt, he would have defeated it. But you know what? God is never defeated. The women that we are going to look at this afternoon are the midwives in this book of Exodus chapter 1. Have you noticed how many verses these women have been captured? Just are they equal to the verses that have been given, the concentration that have been given to Hannah in the book of Samuel? No. Is it uh, the same attention that have been given to Mary in the book of Rook? No. But you will realize that these women played a very vital role that you and me, that at times we feel insignificant in the society and in the congregation that we can pray in the vineyard of the Lord. Six lessons that I want us to learn from this. The first lesson is that these women, in verse 17, verse 17 said, the, the midwives, however, feared God and did not do what the king of Egypt had told them to do. I don't know how many of us, maybe there are those who work in the state offices or in the public service, as it is called. Maybe there are those who work in the private sectors. Maybe there are those who work, really, as entrepreneurs in their own area or in their own scheme. But I don't know how many of us would dare to go against the decree of a president. Leave alone the king. I mean, in, in, in Kenya, we've not had uh, to experience the force of a king, but we can all see how uh, the people from England behave because of kings and queens, right? And prince and princes, right? And, but for us, if you are given a decree by the king, umeitoko officia, president, mwenyewe, eh? The first thing, the, the mere fact that you've been called, eh? And you've walked to that office, gives you goosebump. So whatever the king or, or the president says, you would be more than willing to adhere to it. And this, I don't think at any point Pharaoh thought that these women can go against him, can disobey his role. Because you know, a role of a fellow, Pharaoh was a god. He was a son of God in that context. And so whatever he says is carried without a question. And so he gives these women a decree. And the women say, mm, there is something wrong with this decree. And they wait in the balance of the knowledge that they have about God. And they say, mm -mm, this one I can't do. This, the driving force was the fear of God. Brothers and sisters, the book of Proverbs, chapter 8, open with me, the book of Proverbs, chapter 8, and verse 13. Proverbs, chapter 8, and verse 13 tells us, to fear the Lord is to hate evil. I hate pride and arrogance, evil behavior and perverse speech. But I want to take the part A of that verse. The fear, to fear the Lord is to hate evil. These women knew that killing children was evil. Or was it right? Was it right? No, they knew that it was evil. And so they had to hate evil. And that is how they showed their fear of God to the world. 
they feared the Lord and so they did hate that what is evil. You know, God takes notice not only of you as an adult, but even of the small babies. Is it not he who says that he knew us before we were woven in our mother's wombs? Does it mean that we come to him by surprise? No. And so the life of those children were precious in the sight of God, just as the life of Pharaoh or the midwives were in the sight of the Lord. And, and, and it doesn't end there, children of God. Psalms 31, verse 19, tells us something about those that fear the Lord. Psalms 31 and verse 19. It says, Psalms 31 and verse 19 says, How abundant are the good things that you have stored up for those who fear you, that you bestow in the sight of all on those who take refuge in you. And I want to tell you, children of God, for whoever fears the Lord, God takes notice of that. Yes, it is not just another moment of passing, but God takes notice of that. And the fear of the Lord, it leads somebody to choose the costs and the sacrifice of giving up, the cost and sacrifice of giving up all that you have and to suffer just because you want to honor God. So if you really can be able to separate yourself from the comfort that comes you know, the, the temporal comfort that comes with compromise, then the fear of God is in you. And it says, to fear God means to acknowledge God as the supreme being and Lord of our lives, who alone is worthy of obedience, allegiance, and worship. Every time that you do something that is contrary to what God has said, you are ac actually giving your allegiance. To somebody else and so anything that rises be, be, that rises above that says the Lord need to be really measured and weighed the second lesson that I want us to learn from this story is that God gave this with these women exceeding wisdom they handled the situation with a lot of wisdom you know, in verse 18, the book of Exodus, Exodus chapter 1 and verse 18 says, Then the king of Egypt summoned the midwives and asked them, Why have you done this? Why have you left the boys to live? God, in his own wisdom, you see, the moment you give yourself to be used of God, he also gives you wisdom. He doesn't leave you just to fear him just to say no to what is evil and he leaves you. He actually walks with you and he gives you what will happen next and prepares you for the next step. These women, in their godly given wisdom, they knew the king must question why is plan B not working? We all know, especially for us who are, uh, who are employed eh? and you're given goals, right? And you do not meet your target. And the next thing, your boss calls you to a boardroom and sits you down and asks you, what is happening? And when that question comes, we all tremble. You know, because you have to explain it. And if you had not prepared well and you had not seen the situation, then it gets you off guard, right? But God gave these women wisdom. They knew their master, the king, was to come and question I gave you a very good plan B. Why is it not working? We said it is okay they can conceive. It's okay they can give birth. But the children must die at the stool bath. And so these women, they thought it. And because they don't want to be part of this wicked plan, they also gave it a leeway. And so they come and tell the king, you know what? These women, the Hebrew women, are not like the Egyptian women. Huh? 
These women are vigorous. They're very hard working. Eh? Their body opens up before they come. So by the time they're coming, the child is already born. So we have no part to play in this. And do you think that is a human with, do you think that is a human knowledge? Do you think that is a, a manly understanding? Is that plan like the one for Pharaoh? No. Because they were doing it in line with God. And it is God who bestowed them wisdom. Children of God, every time that you fear God and you do that very thing that honors God, he gives you wisdom to tackle the situations that otherwise would have swallowed you. And do you think this, uh, King Pharaoh had anything against these women? No. This was beyond any human comprehension, the under, you know, the explanation they've given. And truly, if the women of Hebrew give birth before they come, what could they, the midwives, have done? Nothing. And so every situation, it all starts with fearing God. Brothers and sisters, if you fear God and you seek to honor him with all that you do and you are, he will give you wisdom to tackle those moments that you think are giants. Imagine these women would have sat on the other side and think, eh, what will the king do? By the way, for every defiance character to the king, it calls for death, an instant death. And for them, death is something so simple. I mean, nikunyo maji tu, kupita tu, you know. For those who have worked with some communities, you can attest that uh, there are some communities that taking a life doesn't take a lot of effort. It's just a passing. It's just a passing. And it is sad because they do not value life. And so it was, if, this mid, if the king would have known that these midwives had a hand in this, their life would have been gone. But you know what? They chose, they better lose their own life but honor God. Do you remember that statement that was given by the three Hebrew boys before the king? They said, we will not be careful to answer you in this manner. Our God is able to save us from the fiery furnace. And even if he does not save us, we still will not bow down to you. If that becomes the conviction of you and me this day, believe me, you, the mountains that you're seeing, God will give you wisdom to tackle them. The book of Job 28, 28 tells us that the fear of God is to shun evil. The fear of God is to shun evil. And these women, we have seen them do so. So the third lesson that I want us to learn from this is they chose to obey God rather than man. You know, these women, they had a choice to say that this was a decree from the king. So nothing to do about it. And actually I'm reminded what mostly, uh, and not only, it, it is a common phrase with the young people, but even the adult usually takes it up. Seek one a choice. You know, seek one a choice. Sindio. So when you've done that thing and later you realize that this was against, then you say, ah, seek one a choice. But let me tell you, brothers and sisters, in every circumstance and situation that God allows you to go through, you have a choice. You know, it calls for simple choices. Simple choices of what to eat, what not to eat. What to dress and what not to dress. What way to go and what not way to go. And big choices like what to invest and what not to invest in. What relationship to indulge in and what relationship not to indulge in. What company to keep and what company to shun. Those choices. Those little, little choices that seem little in our eyes actually contribute to our spiritual battles. So you and me in every circumstance, every situation, God is calling us to make a choice. It is very incorrect to think that we have no choice of our own. Lakini wazazi wangu walini chagulia, you know? Lakini... Rafiki yangu walifanya, but my employer said, 
you know but it is a decree that i should but my teacher said i have to go to school on sabbath but my employer said i will not get a leave on sabbath and the other one says but my parent bought the clothes for me you know it is very incorrect to think that you have no rights to make a choice assuming that whatever is imposed on you leave you with no choice is actually a sin do you know why because you will do that what is wrong when you look at the book of deuteronomy chapter 30 verse 19 to 20 deuteronomy chapter 30 from 19 to 20 deuteronomy the bible says and this is moses talking to the children of israel and he told after giving them you know if you read it from verse 11 all down but we will not you will read it in your own time he tells them verse just to give you a glimpse of it uh, deuteronomy chapter 30 and verse 11 says now what i am commanding you today is not too difficult for you all beyond your reach so whatever moses was telling them it's not too much that they would say ah this is too much leave it in verse 19 he says this day i call the heavens and the earth as witnesses against you that i have set before you life and death blessing and curses now choose life so that you and your children may live and many 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 circumstances and situations that we find ourselves in life requires to choose the two life or death and moses told them choose life that you may live you and your children but what do we usually think ah ini kitu ndogo tu si ni kuchagua tu ini kitu ndogo but let me tell you they end up having those very little things we we think about they end up having grave consequences joshua in the book of joshua chapter 24 and verse 15 he told the children of israel when he was about to leave them choose for yourself this day whom you will serve whether the gods that your father served on the other side of euphrates and and they say but for me and my house i will serve the lord and so in every situation i don't know what you're going through but it is calling for you to choose my brother my sister do not be shrewd eh? do not be wise in your own eyes make a choice that will honor god if it means that you leave that relationship decisively leave it for the glory of god lakini ni lakini nilijipata mama yangu akinipeleka kwa daktari unajua daktari ni nani a which a which doctor it calls for you to choose choose to stand and choose to stand alone choose to honor god with all that you have the spirit of prophecy in the book counsels for the church the pen of inspiration that is page 314 the pen of inspiration says he who has god's laws written in the heart will obey god rather than men and will sooner disobey all men than deviate in the least from the commandment of god god's people taught by the inspiration of truth and led by a good conscience to live by every word of god will take his law written in their heart as the only authority which they can acknowledge or consent to obey the wisdom and authority of the divine law are supreme god is calling you god is calling me 
to make a decision and to choose for him. The other thing that I want us to learn, and I will be a little bit quick, they stood against injustice and defended the helpless. Imagine how helpless the children were. You and me, we never chose to be born, did we? Did we, did we choose where to be born? Gladys. Ulisema uzaliwe hospital gani? Uliamua uchague sister Sela, ulisema uzaliwe kwa wazazi wa gani? No! We all found ourselves, yani ni zile tunajepata. And we have no choice, we have no control over how and where we will be born. And so these children that were, be, were to be subjected to this animosity, they were helpless. But these women stood to defend them. You and me, we've been called as well to defend the helpless. God has given us a task to defend the helpless. I know you will say, I mean, these women would have, these midwives would have reasoned. I do not sit in the council of the Pharaoh. Or were they the, the counselors of king? No. They were actually, they were neither even uh, the advisors of the king. Wow, ni wakutekeleza. Eh? They are told and then they do. And so they had, uh, they had uh, a reason to say, I can't do it because you know I have no power. But in the risk that they could be able to do, they gave their hand. Sister Nancy has stood here and have spoken about a ministry, a compassionate ministry. It is me and you. Or do we want God to open the doors and the gates of heaven and pour grains for those who do not have? God is calling you and me to stand and defend the helpless. He wants us actually to be the hand, his hand that will touch those who are in need. Could it be your place of work? If in your place, if, you, if, you, if you're in a position of authority, stand and defend the helpless. If it is in the society, you are well advantaged and somebody stand and defend the helpless. It is in church. We've been called to give a hundred shillings so that we can be able to defend those who are helpless that do not have food. Let us stand up and be counted like these two midwives. Let us not stand to be spectators because spectators will not be guiltless. Proverbs 31.8 says, speak for those who cannot speak for themselves. Lesson number five. Their faithfulness saved the entire race of the Hebrew. You can imagine, God had ordained that a deliverer of the Israelites would be born and the devil came in so that he would cut off. It is because of the help that they extended that Moses saw the light of the day. So you and me, we may not know by withholding the help to those who need it, really what we withhold, what divine plan we withhold. So rise up and work for God. You do not know what your small effort, what impact it will have on society today and maybe in the generations to come. It may look insignificant at that what seemed for the two midwives, but it had a great significance for the whole race uh, of the Israelites. Lesson number six in verse 20. When these women stood for God, God rewarded their faithfulness. You know, uh, the Bible says in Exodus chapter one and verse 20, it says, so God was kind to the midwives and the people increased and became even more numerous. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families of their own. Because these midwives chose to stand for God. They feared God, they honored God, they stood for others. God met their physical need, the need of families. Could it be that you are lacking just because you are holding back for others? Could it be? Rise up, stretch for that support for that person who need and who knows what blessing is waiting for you on the way because God is faithful and when he promises, he surely, he surely does. 
Brothers and sisters, those may be the few points or even much more that we would learn from these stories. You see, if you look at the attention that has been given to these women is just from verse 15 to verse 21. 15 to 21, there are six verses, right? But look at how loaded their life is with lessons for you and for me. Do you at times count yourself as insignificant, as helpless, as unimportant? Maybe because you do not have material wealth. Maybe because you do not have attained education like others. But with that what you have, where God has praised you, he's able to use you if you avail yourself for him. We are called to live like Shifra and Poa, studying against evil. We are called not to compromise to the temptation of our faith. We are called to make a choice. A spiritual battle was raging behind the scenes when all this was happening. And God needed faithful warriors to stand against the enemy. To defeat his purpose and to honor him through their faithfulness. Shephra and Pua took up the challenge. Will you? May the Lord help us.